If your mind goes blank when you look at such questions, then this lesson is for you. Let's look at the first question. Why does a person feel heavier as the lift moves upwards with an acceleration? Why does a pendulum suspended from the ceiling of a car, and let's say the car is accelerated forward, swing in the backward direction? Or why does water not spill out from a bucket that is rotated in a vertical circle? It's easier to do these questions using pseudo forces and remember there are no spooky forces, they are real forces. When I am standing in the lift, my weight mg acts downwards and a reaction r from the lift acts upwards. Any other forces? No. So if I am at rest in this accelerating lift, that means the net force on my body is zero or I can say r is equal to mg. Now, r is the weight that I feel. But if I feel heavier, there has to be some force in addition to my weight that is pulling me downwards. Now, what is this force? Now, let's look at the pendulum. The pendulum is suspended. Its weight, mg, acts downwards. There is a tension, t, in the rope or the string that acts upwards. That's all, no other forces. However, when the car accelerates in the forward direction, the pendulum is, suppose this is the vertical position of the pendulum, the pendulum swings backwards. It swings in this direction. Again, some other force which is acting on the pendulum, something that we can't account for. If you look at the water over here, the weight of the water, mg, acts downwards. Now, there has to be some force which is acting upwards. Again, that strange spooky force which keeps the water in the bucket. Now, we don't call it a spooky force. In scientific language, this is called a fictitious force or a pseudo force. Now, why the name fictitious? Is this a figment of our imagination? Are we just imagining that there is a force over here? No, a force actually acts. But the problem is, it doesn't belong to one of the four categories of forces that we know. Now, these forces are neither gravitational forces, nor electromagnetic forces, nor nuclear forces, either strong or weak. So now let's understand why do these pseudo forces come into picture. If you remember, we said in the beginning that all these are accelerating reference frames. It appears that pseudo force has something to do with such frames of reference. The lift was accelerating upwards, the car was accelerating forwards, the bucket is in a is the bucket is moving in a circular path, so all the time it has a centripetal acceleration. Now I'm just going to say something. See, be patient if you don't understand it immediately. The statement is, Newton's laws are valid in inertial frames. They do not hold true in accelerated or non-inertial frames. The earth is taken as a good enough inertial frame. So, we take the earth as an inertial frame. Say you have an object that is moving at constant velocity. Say you have a car that is moving at constant velocity. It is not accelerating. This, this can be taken as an inertial frame. All these frames that are accelerating are non-inertial frames. To visualize a reference frame, you can think a person wears a special hat that has an X, Y and a Z axis attached to it. So this is his reference frame. And all distances are measured by this person with respect to these axes and O as the origin. Let's now derive the expression for the pseudo force. Suppose there are two people, Dips who has an origin at O and Chips who has an origin in a parallel coordinate system and the origin O dash is elsewhere. Now when Dips measures the location of a point P in space, he uses coordinates x, y and z and when chips measures the same point, he uses coordinates x dash, y dash and z dash. Now you can see over here 
that the y coordinate is same for both of them and we have not taken the z coordinate just to keep things simple. By the way, Chips and Dips are my nephews and they are twins. Chips is the smarter one, but I think Dips is the sweeter guy and he's always ready to help everyone. You know, when they were very young, we used to call them Chippo and Dippo, but I can't possibly do that now because they're going to get really, really mad at me. Okay, now coming back to this question over here. See, Chips is moving to the velocity u with respect to dips. So, chips has a velocity u with respect to dips. And we are assuming that dips is at rest with respect to the earth. The question is, dips says that ma is equal to f in my frame of reference. Now, we know that dips is, an is in an inertial frame of reference and Newton's laws are going to work for him. But can Chips also say that m a dash is equal to f a dash for him because we are just using a dash or a prime for the reference frame in all quantities in Chips frame of reference. So, can Chips also say that? Will Newton's laws work for chips also? Let's take a look at this now. Position of point P with respect to dips is x. This distance is x. And for chips, see this, the distance it has moved in time t is ut. So you can see that the distance over here is x prime. And we can write x prime as x minus ut. Now, assumption is chips is moving so that his coordinate system is parallel to dips. And just to keep things simple, we are only considering motion along the x-axis. Now, let's find the velocity of that both of them are measuring. If you differentiate this with respect to time, you get the velocity as seen by chips and this is the velocity as seen by dips. U is a constant and differentiating dt over dt will be equal to 1 and since u is a constant you can take it outside the differentiation. So this gives us v prime is equal to v minus u. The velocities that both of them measure are different. For instance, if uh, this is actually a commonly observed phenomenon, suppose chips is moving in a bus that moves at a constant velocity u and he, velo and he measures the velocity of a stationary tree over here and chips is moving in this bus. Now the velocity of the tree as measured by chips would be v prime equals minus u since his velocity is u. The velocity of this tree would be v prime equals minus u. But dips would laugh at him and he say, no, the velocity v is 0. Because that is the velocity of the tree in his frame. Since he is at rest, so with respect to him, the tree is at rest. But the velocity of the tree as, measure, as measured by chips would be minus u. Both of them are correct. Okay. Now, let's proceed further and find the acceleration. So, we need to differentiate this once again with respect to time. And once we do that, we get dv prime over dt is dv over dt. And since u is a constant, this differentiation would be 0, which gives us a prime is equal to a. Now, this is interesting. They both measure the same acceleration of the for the point P, though they measured different velocities for this point. We are multiplying both sides with m because the assumption is mass remains the same. Mass is invariant. So, m a dash is equal to m a or we can say f dash is equal to f. Now, for chips, we have m a dash equals f dash 
which is further equal to F. So we can say that Newton's laws are valid for chips also. The force on the particle remains the same even if you measure it from a frame of reference which is moving at a constant velocity with respect to the first frame. So if there is no acceleration which means if you are still in an inertial frame of reference you measure the same force on the particle. Now Chip says enough of this moving at constant velocity. I am going to accelerate and then I am going to see if I experience some different force, if Newton's laws still work for me or not. Tips continues to remain at rest with respect to the earth, so he is still in a inertial frame of reference, but note that now Chips is in a non-inertial frame of reference. The position of point P with respect to Dips is X and the position of point P with respect to Chips is X prime and we can write this as x minus half ft square. Here f is the acceleration of the inertial frame. So you know that you know the equation of motion s is equal to ut plus half at square. We are assuming that the initial velocity of chips is 0. So this term becomes 0. Then, uh, we we've used the symbol F for the acceleration of Chip's frame of reference. So now differentiating this with respect to time will give us the velocity and so dx over dt minus differentiation of t square is 2t. So we have v prime equals v minus ft. The velocities measured by both of them are different just as in the previous case when chips was moving at a constant velocity with respect to dips. Differentiating this once again gives us a prime equals a minus f because t, uh, f is a constant and differentiating t gives us 1. So now if you multiply by mass and we are assuming that mass remains invariant, this is ma minus mf or you can see that now f prime is f minus m f. So now the force with chips would measure is f minus m f. There is a new force which is coming and this new force m f is called the pseudo force. So now we can conclude that since chips coordinate system is accelerating with respect to dips, the extra term mf comes in and Chips will have to correct his forces by this amount in order to get Newton's laws to work for him. If he wants to find the acceleration, then the total force that he has to take is f minus mf. Now this fictitious force of unknown origin arises because CHIPS is in an accelerating coordinate system and the modification required while working in a non-inertial frame is to include an extra term minus mf. So if the frame is accelerating in this direction then the force that you have to take is in the opposite direction as indicated by this negative sign over here. Now let's look at those questions once again and we'll include a pseudo force minus mf and see if we are able to explain the observed phenomena. So if you look at the lift and let's say Dips who is standing on the ground, he is observing the lift, the accelerating lift. The acceleration of the lift is in this direction which is f. As observed by Dips, we have r is equal to mg. But as observed by Chips, who is riding in this accelerated frame of reference, he will feel another force, an additional force downwards, which is the pseudo force. So the force as seen by Chips is you have 
the weight mg of the man acting down a reaction r acting upwards and the pseudo force mf acting downwards so we have this is mg this is r and this is mf so you can see r is equal to mg plus mf which means the man is going to feel heavier as he rides in the lift now let's look at the car the car is accelerating forward it has an acceleration f in this direction as observed by dips you would have the weight of the pendulum mg acting down and a tension t acting upwards so for dips you have mg equals t but for chips you would have since the car is accelerating in the forward direction there is a pseudo force minus mf acting on the pendulum in the opposite direction so as seen by chips who's riding the accelerated frame of reference chips is in the car so he observes three forces which is tension upwards mg down and a pseudo force mf in this direction so the direction at which the pendulum will rest will be the resultant of these three forces next if you look at the water in the bucket then as seen by dips over here the weight mg of the bucket of the water in the bucket is acting down and there is no force which is there to to actually keep the water in the bucket but since chips is sitting in the bucket and he can feel the centrifugal force so he says okay i'll just mark the acceleration of the bucket the centrifugal acceleration is in this direction so the pseudo force will be in the opposite direction the pseudo force will act in this direction so as seen by chips mg is equal to mf so the water doesn't spill out